They say you should never judge a book by its cover, but I say you should absolutely judge a YouTuber by their thumbnail design. Lately I've been spending a lot more time planning and designing my thumbnails, and I've really tried to ask myself what makes a good thumbnail on YouTube. This question has always intrigued me because thumbnails are extremely important in theory. They are the first thing anyone sees before they even think about clicking on your video. They act as a gateway to your world, your first and sometimes only means of enticing total strangers to spare a moment of their time to watch you. However, despite their theoretical importance, thumbnails are one of the least explored elements of YouTube production in my opinion, mostly because it's really difficult to truly appraise their worth. If you get a million view video, how much of that was directly because of the thumbnail? This ambiguity is what causes many YouTubers to treat thumbnails like an afterthought. Usually by the time you have to pick a thumbnail, you've already spent ages writing, recording, and editing the video and you're exhausted. You just want the video to be done and uploaded so you slap some bold text on a neat looking frame and call it a day. Unfortunately, this line of thinking results in most thumbnails looking generic and unremarkable. But occasionally you'll stumble across one that distinctly captures your attention. The effect that every YouTuber should strive to achieve. So what aspects about a thumbnail separate the memorable from the mundane? I asked my fans on Twitter and it turns out that the most memorable and iconic thumbnails come, unsurprisingly, from the most memorable and iconic videos. Or from thumbnails so outrageous in design that they overshadow the video itself. Ultimately, these kinds of thumbnails were remembered as a matter of circumstance. But how do you determine a thumbnail's implicit value? Moreover, what are the underlying design aspects that contribute to an inherently memorable thumbnail? Well, first of all, before anyone can even take your thumbnail seriously, you have to at least make it visually clear. If graphic design is not your passion, you can at least follow these two main principles to make your stuff look halfway decent. First is the figure ground principle. The audience should immediately be able to tell what to focus on in the frame. You have to compose the image so that the objects are clearly distinct from the background. You can achieve this by adjusting the color, contrast, size, and focus of the visual elements. The second principle you need to know is the rule of thirds. It's a very simple and effective guideline for placing objects in a frame. Aligning your focal points along the thirds will immediately make your thumbnail more visually appealing. There are many other basic visual design techniques that I would recommend researching on your own, but these are the two most important for YouTube thumbnails. Okay, so you understand basic thumbnail design on a technical level, but how can you improve them on a rhetorical level? To answer this, I tried to seek inspiration from other genres, starting with album covers, which for decades filled the same role that YouTube thumbnails do today. Across more than a half century of popular music, a few album covers have stood the test of time as absolute icons of our culture. So what made these covers so memorable? Well, they all managed to condense great meaning into a singular striking image. They are effective in both their symbolism and their simplicity. The same can be said for the most iconic movie posters. These designs are so iconic because they effectively accomplish the objective of any thumbnail design, to represent the overall work using a single icon. Visual symbolism is probably the most important factor in creating thumbnails, movie posters, and album covers. And even though all three of these media types share many of the same strategies for success, they have one major difference in the amount of real estate they have to work with. Not only do YouTube thumbnails occupy a much smaller space, they are slotted against a much higher volume of competition. Whereas movie posters usually only have to stand out from a dozen or so competitors, YouTube thumbnails exist among an ocean of similar content, all competing for the same sets of eyeballs. For this reason, designing YouTube thumbnails may be the most difficult job of its kind. Because not only do you have to persuade the audience to choose you over the rest of the pack, you have to do so within a space that's often less than half the size of a business card. Because of these limitations, YouTube thumbnails don't have the liberty to compose intricate, detailed designs with sneaky hidden easter eggs. There simply isn't enough room. And on YouTube, it's very interesting to see this challenging graphic design problem tackled by people who don't even know how to caption a meme in Microsoft Paint. As we've seen earlier, this can often lead to some... unique results. But as much as we ridicule these examples, in my opinion they add to the rustic DIY charm of YouTube, a site where random amateurs can still succeed in spite of their technical shortcomings. YouTubers are inherently scrappy. They aren't traditional, boring, name-brand products like AirPods. They're hungry, emerging contenders with so much to prove, like Raycon.
Oh boy, would you look at that. Due to the prevailing circumstances, the world economy is on a downward spiral, everyone's losing money, nobody knows if they can even afford next month's rent. Well, based on my humble experience as a YouTuber, all I can say is, make yourself comfortable. And you can make yourself comfortable with Raycon, now starting at just half the price of other premium wireless earbud brands. As companies slash marketing budgets and ad revenue plummet site-wide, Raycon is still out here picking up the slack and helping YouTubers put out content at a time when it's needed more than ever. So the next time you're in the market for wireless earbuds, ditch the AirPods along with the clown makeup and pick up a pair of Raycon Everyday E25s. Featuring 6 hours of battery life, enhanced bass, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and a sleek, compact, noise-isolating design, Raycon is perfect for listening to music, podcasts, or a one-hour loop of the downward spiral while you're creating the next iconic YouTube thumbnail. So order some Raycons today in your choice of color. Check the description below and visit buyraycon.com slash amplemon for 15% off your purchase and tune out the rest of your world. In the early days of YouTube, there were no custom thumbnails. The site would just let you pick from three random frames in your video, and you had to hope and pray that one of them looked halfway decent. This led to pretty hilarious examples of clickbait in the pre-thumbnail age, where gimmick channels who wanted to snatch some cheap views literally had to make the thumbnail into the video itself. Around the turn of the decade, YouTube enabled custom thumbnails for partnered channels, who at the time only represented the very tippy top of creators on the site. Naturally, when given the tools to make the first custom thumbnails on YouTube, these channels tried to create the opposite of the default experience. With channels like Ray William Johnson, you can witness an evolution of thumbnail strategy. At first, you see them apply the bait and switch tactic, which is basically what those proto clickbait channels were trying to do anyway, only this time they could actually perform the switch. Eventually, when audiences learned to no longer trust videos where the thumbnail looked like it was ripped straight from Google Images, channels began to pivot to a new strategy. As the first generation of YouTube stars were born, they shifted themselves to the center of attention, and with that came the first attempts at thumbnail branding. This brought about the rise of eccentric facial expressions on a bright, saturated color background. It's a design that served as a blueprint for the decades to follow, and it's probably what most people think of when they imagine what a prototypical YouTube thumbnail looks like. For the first time ever, YouTubers had to think about how not to just gain viewers, but to retain viewers. Convincing people to click on one of your videos is the easy part. Convincing them to click on the next one is a lot more challenging. This concept forced creators to think more long term about their thumbnail design. Around 2013, branding thumbnails became an even more important tactic when YouTube released the feature for everyone. I always remember when it happened because I immediately dropped everything to create my first ever custom thumbnail on my latest video. That video, of course, was The Uncredibles. And after changing the thumbnail, the video exploded in popularity, becoming the most viewed video on my channel. So it's quite possible that the only reason I'm here today is because of this one thumbnail. Oh by the way, I just wanted to add here that there's a theory going around the YouTube community that changing your thumbnails on existing videos can help boost performance in the algorithm. I've never tried this personally, so if anyone has any evidence of this actually working, I'd be really interested to hear about it. For years, the biggest channels could coast off the exclusivity of the custom thumbnail feature, which helped serve as a great divider between the haves and the have-nots. Now that everyone had access to the feature, YouTube had leveled the playing field, and the thumbnail metagame was about to get a lot more advanced. Once the floodgates opened, channels had to make their branding much more specific. Soon enough, they would find that certain fonts, colors, and templates were becoming totally redundant, and YouTubers were forced to consider alternative branding strategies to remain unique. At this point, you saw channels turn to custom logos, character avatars, and irregular text design. You can include each of these elements to improve your branding, but in doing so, you run the risk of devaluing the overall design. For example, it's very common for YouTubers to use their face as part of their thumbnail branding, and in theory it makes a ton of sense, given that your face is a naturally unique identifier. Our eyes are naturally drawn to faces and have evolved to perceive very subtle differences in facial structure as a means of recognizing people. So how is this a bad thing for thumbnail design? Well, facial recognition only really works if you already recognize someone. This strategy works for the huge channels that everyone already knows, but for smaller channels, well, your face is totally meaningless. This is the reason why blockbuster movie posters tend to show off the name brand actors while smaller films tend to be a lot more subtle about it. If the vast majority of the audience won't recognize you, then your face is just a waste of space. 
And therein lies the most challenging issue of YouTube thumbnails. To what extent are you willing to sacrifice visual design to improve your branding? Logos, faces, text, avatars, all these things take up space and detract from the actual subject matter of the video. As a creator, you want your thumbnail to pique the interest of the audience through striking design, but you also want it to visually connect to your other work through cohesive branding. So how do you balance these seemingly contrary principles? The answer is through stylization. You must learn to make your brand intrinsic to your visual composition. You have to learn how to communicate meaning without using text or logos. It's the visual design equivalent of show, don't tell. Achieving this may seem difficult at a glance, but the process can actually be made somewhat intuitive as long as you make the thumbnail stylistically consistent with the video. Basically, whatever style you naturally use in your videos, you should also apply to your thumbnail design. Again, it's like poetry, so sort if of they rhyme. I know that it's lame to hear yet another advice video telling you to be yourself, but in this instance it definitely bears repeating. I see some videos where it looks like the creator spent more time editing together the thumbnail than the video itself. The thumbnail acts as a tool for the audience to form baseline expectations as they head into the video. And when those expectations are not congruent with the overall product, it can often leave the audience feeling confused or dissatisfied. This applies not just to the overall production value of the video, but the pacing, direction, and tone as well. For example, Frederick Knudsen and Internet Historian both cover similar subjects of internet lore, but their tonality is completely different. Frederick's videos tend to be dry and straightforward, while Internet Historians tend to be a lot more casual and comedic. But you don't have to watch any of their videos to figure this out. Both of their presentation styles could be inferred directly from their thumbnail design. And with this, you have to realize that the point of a thumbnail is not to look pretty or to clickbait the audience. The point of a thumbnail is to serve as a succinct representation of the video and its creator. The thumbnail should telegraph to the audience exactly what to expect when entering your world. Ideally, the audience should be able to tell exactly whose video they're clicking on by looking at the thumbnail alone. As long as you achieve this, the thumbnail has done its job. But with that being said, don't let these guidelines serve as restrictions on what you're allowed to create. YouTube is a playground of experimentation. You can get away with more here than you can anywhere else. You know, as much as we laugh at the more absurd thumbnail designs, maybe they're onto something. As with most things on YouTube, one of the best strategies in the meta is, counterintuitively, to be anti-meta. As long as your thumbnails make people think of you, well, the end justifies the means. Whatever route you take to get there is your own choice. The strategies of the future will be first introduced by the radical experimentation of today, and I'm interested to see where the meta's gonna go from here. One technique I'd like to see explored more is negative space. Rebel Taxi has always used this design method to give his thumbnails a very unique look. Basically, if you match the outline of your thumbnail to the same color as the default YouTube background, you could theoretically customize the shape of the thumbnail itself. I'd also be interested in seeing how people play around with information flow. Lately, I've been seeing a trend of creators using the thumbnail to raise a question that is answered by the subsequent video. This technique seems to play on the audience's curiosity and dares them to fill in the conceptual blanks. Perhaps the most iconic example of this is Vsauce's newer videos. His thumbnails first come off making absolutely no sense whatsoever. And then, after watching the video, you're like, oh, so that's what it means. It's a really unique effect that I don't think he gets enough credit for. Hmm. Thank you. Anyway, I just wanted to finish up this video by walking you through my process for making thumbnails, using my last video as an example. So going into this video, I didn't have a clear idea for the thumbnail. For some videos, I know exactly what the thumbnail will be before I even go to write the script, but in this case, I didn't. I did plan for the title to be Operation Red Herring, so my first idea for the thumbnail was to put the Matt Watson head icon on a fish's body. But then I thought that would be a little too on the nose and not really representative of what the video was actually about. Luckily, by the end of the video, I had tons of visual assets to brainstorm something different. I first decided to include this high contrast image of Matt, which I took from his channel banner in colored red. I felt this image perfectly represents the two sides of Matt Watson, the public persona and the digital poltergeist. For the other side of the frame, I rearranged the elements of another composition to create this design. I applied a shatter effect to the text to make it more cohesive with the broken glass, with the symbolism here being that Matt shattered the YouTube ecosystem through his militant campaign. 
I was somewhat satisfied with this, but I didn't like how the little YouTube wake up icon was pretty indistinguishable at thumbnail size, so I decided to replace it with a red radial gradient instead. I altered the broken glass effect a bit and ended up with this design. Unfortunately, when I scaled the image down, I thought that the text just wasn't readable enough, and that the overall frame was just too cluttered. So I decided to get rid of the text and broken glass filter, leaving just the radial pattern. Immediately, I found this version to be a lot more striking and elegant. The text wasn't that necessary, and I felt that the more mysterious design did a better job at capturing the essence of the video. The red radial pattern has a double meaning of representing the proverbial wormhole of Matt Watson, as well as the waves of outrage he created. So the fundamental design was in place, and all I had to do now was make the radial pattern a bit dirtier, to better represent the messy and inconclusive details of the mystery. After testing out a bunch of different filters, I decided on this newsprint effect. I like it so much because the closer you look into it, the fuzzier it becomes, which is exactly how I felt researching Matt Watson's story. And there we have it, just add a red border for branding and that's one finished thumbnail. You may be wondering if I'm overthinking all this, and if anyone really notices this attention to detail. All I can say to that is that you may not have noticed it, but your brain did. A diamond, appetite, for Aurora Sweets! And I want more! 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 Oh! Aurora Sweets was an inside job. You fool, I say! I don't get involved in violence. In Japan, they call it anime. Nine, it's nine. Downward spiral. I'm glad you came to see me, Paul. Cookie dough.